He began work at Tizard in 2007, uh, motivated by the Centre's commitment to high quality research and innovative teaching programmes. He's held a variety of teaching consultancy roles and has completed and developed research that aims to increase both the evidence base for supporting people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and actual use of this in practice. Has had several split posts and comments in the NHS working as clinical psychologist to support both children and adults with intellectual disabilities. Um, the title of the next session is Goal Formation Engaging People Directly in Our Own Functional Assessment. Um, and the takeaways from here really are for ways to involve people with communication complexities in creating their own goals for behavioural support. So without anything further from me, um, off to Nick uh, and um, away we go. Thank you, Nick. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Andy, and uh, and thank you, Sandy, as well, for a, a fantastic uh, start to the morning. My head's uh, now full of a whole range of additional um, ideas and, and concepts. Um, so I'm going to try and start up the presentation just now. And hopefully that's OK for everyone. All right. So um, thank you again, Andy, for the, the, the lovely introduction. Um, as Andy said, I'm, I'm a, a clinical psychologist. I'm a board certified behavior analyst as well. Um, and I work um, at this place here called Tizard Centre, um, University of Kent. We're based in Canterbury. Um, and I do a variety of different things there. Um, so I do some teaching. Um, and that's um, our ABA and PBS uh, master's cohort uh, the year before we went into to lockdown. Um, if you want to play a game of Where's Wally, I'm the guy on the end there squinting awkwardly into the sun. Uh, that's Serena Tomlinson next to me. You might be able to spot uh, Thanos there and, and Peter Baker um, and, and, uh, and Kira Adam as well. Um, so we do a lot of teaching, I also do a lot of research, um, uh, which tends to have uh, quite a practical uh, applied uh, basis. Um, and at Tizard Centre, we also provide consultancy. So we provide things like training. We also engage in some clinical work um, with individuals and families um, and to support services. Um, and then we connect uh, lots of this work together into informing guidance and in policy. And all of the work really at Tizard Centre um, is supported on, uh, is focused on supporting people with learning disabilities and or people who are autistic um, and often uh, the people around them, so families and staff teams and others. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today um, and share some ideas around um, is uh, some perspectives from positive behaviour support uh, that might connect to this question of whose decision is it anyway. Um, so you might be aware that uh, there's been a, a recent refreshed definition of positive behaviour support for the UK, just came out uh, a few months ago. Um, and I want to start by uh, summarising some of the key uh, kind of components and aspects um, of that paper in a way which connects to this um, uh, to this kind of theme of the day. I also want to uh, give a couple of examples of, of the sort of how to do some of these things. So some examples uh, and emphasizing the sum um, of, of ways to uh, support direct engagement with people who have intellectual um, and or developmental disabilities within uh, some of the things which typically need to happen as part of positive behaviour support. Um, so specifically thinking about how we select um, and work with others to generate goals um, for positive behaviour support um, and how we uh, work with people directly as part of their own uh, functional assessment. Um, and hopefully we'll have enough time left at the end for some uh, discussion together and opportunities to come back uh, to some of these ideas later in the day as, as part of the, the panel. Okay, so this question of whose decision is it anyway, um, to me, when I'm thinking about positive behaviour support in particular, um, is maybe reflected in terms of two uh, overarching dimensions of rights. So we've got 
uh, rights in terms of agency. So the right for people to be able to determine um, the direction of their own life, really, to make decisions um, and decide what's what's right for them. We've also got the dimension of rights in terms of effectiveness. So the right to experience um, be within the context of high quality support, the most effective forms of support. Um, and the possibility that these things actually uh, go hand in hand so that by increasing agency, we find a route to providing the highest quality of support, the most effective forms of support for individuals. And within PBS, uh, those things, I think, come together quite neatly because we've got this idea of integration, integration of um, rights and values and the practical means of doing things um, and the potential uh, to enhance, uh, maximise decision making for individuals throughout uh, a PBS process in terms of the activities that make up the work of PBS. So in terms of creating goals, assessment, uh, selecting and implementing interventions um, and, and evaluating those over time. So we'll keep, um, I think, coming back to these sort of ideas as, as, a, as a move through the, the presentation this morning. So definitions then. Um, so starting right at the beginning, you know, what, why, why spend some time, I think, uh, kind of generating and looking at definitions? Well, they are, I would suggest, important. They're not everything, uh, but they do provide an important part of what needs to uh, be in place to, to really make things happen. So in general terms, uh, definitions are about describing and explaining what something is or, or what it, it means. It allows us to try and be as clear as possible um, about what this something is and also what it's not, to be able to discriminate instances of it. Um, and it's a part of what we need um, in order to make things happen. So in the context of positive behavioural support, um, it's part of what we might need to be able to determine when instances of positive, uh, of positive behaviour support are happening or when they're not happening and what that looks like. Lots and lots of other things are needed as well, but it's an important element for us to kind of come back to and to base other uh, pieces of work on. So you'll probably be familiar that um, there was a there was a kind of a pre-runner to this. So in 2013, uh, there was a series of papers that were released um, as a special edition of the International Journal of Positive uh, Behaviour Support. Um, and those are papers that came together in the context of the Winterbourne View scandal. Um, and the intention here from the contributors was to create some kind of consensus, some kind of shared um, understanding or opinion on um, what good support needs to look like um, to prevent uh, these sorts of situations from occurring again in the future um, and to promote um, and instill good quality support for people with, with learning disabilities. And there were four papers that that were written there. There was one which was about the conceptual um, kind of underpinnings, everything we know about behaviours that challenge, how they come to be, what maintains them in a way that can inform uh, the kind of work we do in positive behaviour support. There was also the definitions paper, the 2013 definitions paper that laid out key components, things which in an integrated way come together to make PBS be what it is and work in the way that it needs to. And then we had two other papers which looked at kind of scaling up um, in terms of implementation and, and workforce development. And those were papers which were written fairly rapidly, really, uh, because there was a need to make this happen rapidly. Um, and through contributions and collaboration uh, between people with quite a lot of similarities, really, I would suggest, from different organisations, but principally people who were researchers, academics, uh, behaviour analysts and, and psychologists. So it was an important thing to do um, and it led to sort of several developments in terms of uh, positive behaviour support in the years that, that followed. Um, so those um, 10 components that came together in the 
in the 2013 definition are arguably still important. They were important then and they're important now. But lots of things have happened since in the UK in relation to positive behaviour support um, and service developments for people with learning disabilities and those at risk of behaviours that challenge more, more generally. Um, and these have been quite exciting developments. Um, and I think we can sort of sort of uh, distill those into three main areas. So firstly, since 2013, there's been increased sort of discussion, discourse between a whole range of different people. So outside of the field uh, of behaviour analysis, I guess. So more interaction with people from different disciplines, from different professions, lots of interaction and discussion uh, between um, and amongst people with direct lived experience of behaviours that challenge. And some of this has been challenging um, in that it's, it's kind of caused us to have to really try and clarify, be uh, much clearer about some of the terms, some of the things we were trying to describe in terms of positive behaviour support as, as, as a field. Sometimes it's caused us to actually question some of the underpinning assumptions um, and to kind of generate some new possibilities for the future. And this is important because positive favour support ultimately is, is, is thought of as an, as an evolving system, really. Um, and the sort of aspirational uh, kind of pillars that Sandy was uh, referring to earlier um, kind of make sense as part of that, that context, I think. So the other thing we've seen happening um, across that period has been closer and closer kind of integration of some of the things which are more UK specific in terms of values and philosophy and technologies, ways of working that have kind of evolved in UK systems, becoming part of uh, what we think of and the way we implement PBS. Um, and as I say, um, greater discussion um, and involvement and interest from uh, a range of professionals um, and people working in different contexts in relation to positive behaviour support. And all of these kind of themes, I think, coming together um, sort of in the direction of this question of whose decision is it anyway? There's a nice synergy between, between these ideas. So not a new definition, um, but something which is refreshed um, and updated and tries to capture some of these changes. Um, and the nuance of these things being really, really important. Um, it's vital that we find ways of kind of trying to clearly express and share and disseminate these ideas. But the subtlety is also uh, very, very important. OK, so how did we do it this time? Well, a little bit different to in 2013. We had a bit more time, um, so that was that was helpful. But we also wanted to do it in a different way. So this time we brought together um, a, a bigger team, so 24 uh, people from the UK um, who had a range of um, experiences um, and expertise relevant to positive behaviour support. And we sought to co-develop this definition. So to reflect um, and integrate the perspectives and the experiences um, of, of everyone that was contributing. And so this was a much broader range of folk. So it included people with uh, lived experience, either as a person with a, a learning disability, as someone who's autistic, um, as someone who has a history of displaying behaviours that challenge and has experienced firsthand uh, what it's like to be supported by PBS, um, or as a family carer. It also included um, researchers and professionals from a whole range of different uh, backgrounds, so behaviour analysts, but also psychologists and physiotherapists, speech and language therapists, a whole range of allied um, health and social care professionals, people that are experienced in working with children and adults, um, and again across a range of different um, service contexts, so schools and social care and health. Um, and doing it in this way was really important in terms of um, you know, creating a good helpful final product, but is also inherent in terms of some of these ideas we're talking about in terms of 
whose decision is it? Whose decision is it in terms of what PBS is? We needed to reflect that in how this definition was, was produced. Um, and so we took our time. We spent uh, quite a bit over five months, actually, in the end, um, discussing and meeting um, and drafting um, and refining this definition. And again, the way we did this was important in terms of some of these uh, bigger questions about engaging uh, with people whose decision it is. Um, so we tailored meetings to try and uh, meet the particular requirements of different people that were contributing. So the particular communication needs they had, the particular sort of social needs they, they might have. Okay, so in terms of the actual definition, well, um, in this 2022 definition, we're focusing particularly on people who have learning disabilities and we provide in, a, in the, the bigger context of the report in which this is published some, some rationale for that in terms of the history of the development of positive paper sport in the, in the UK. And this includes, of course, people with learning disabilities who might have a range of needs, including people with learning disabilities who are autistic. And it includes people across the lifespan um, and um, in a range of different settings. Um, we're not talking about people who have uh, people who are autistic who don't have learning disabilities in this definition. Um, and that's not to say that some of these ideas uh, don't have relevance on things which might be useful. Um, but it's recognizing that the endeavor of creating a definition for people who have autistic who are autistic who don't have learning disabilities needs to be thought of most likely as a, as a separate uh, a separate process to make sure that that contextual fit um, is there in, in that sense. Uh, we're also focusing here um, on uh, the use of positive behaviour support in relation to behaviours that challenge and being quite clear about what sort of behaviours uh, we, we mean there. Um, and defining those behaviours, as Sandy described earlier, in terms of impact, in terms of the consequences they have on the health and well-being and life quality of people who display those behaviours and those that um, are around and, and care for them. We're also um, quite explicit about the goals of positive behaviour support. So we recognise that um, behaviours that challenge um, are more likely uh, in certain contexts. So in the context of poor quality support and poor quality of life, behaviours that challenge um, are more likely uh, to become manifest and to be maintained. And at the same time, by definition, behaviours that challenge have a considerable impact on life quality and opportunities for people who display those behaviours, kind of we get these circular relationships. And so these kind of intertwined complex interactions mean that ultimately uh, PBS needs to have a dual goal. It needs to seek to increase quality of life and quality of support for people with learning disabilities at the same time as reducing uh, the risk of behaviours that challenge the occurrence of those behaviours. Okay. Um, so let's have a look at the actual framework itself and then I'm going to pick out a few of the, the components and talk about those um, in the context of direct engagement with, with individuals who have a learning disability. So we have three clusters of components that come together in this definition which collectively make up this framework of positive behaviour support. So we have things that we can categorise largely in terms of being rights and values that together focus on ways of supporting rights and good lives for people. We have components that we can um, largely think of in relation to providing the theory and the evidence base um, for positive behaviour support, how we can best understand behaviour and people's experience um, and inform ways of um, making rights and values become a reality. 
and then we have a set of components which are really about the practical end of things how we can use theory and evidence base um, in ways which are systematic and ensure um, rights and values uh, become a reality um, in a reliable way for people in their actual lives. Um, so really important to highlight that in 2013, and again here, when we're sort of distilling and describing components in this way, um, this is, I guess, in a way to try and get a handle on what is a very complex uh, kind of system of, of, uh, of ideas. The idea here isn't that this is a, a kind of a menu of choices, but it's an integrated framework. These things kind of come together in dynamic ways. Um, you'll note that in 2013, we described 10 components in our attempt to do that, and we're describing 12 uh, this time around. Okay, so I'm going to show you what we've got here, and then, like I say, we'll pick out a few of these to uh, unpack in a little bit more detail. So in terms of rights and values, um, four things. So this idea of a person-centered foundation, starting with that really is the, is the crux for everything that follows. Um, the const constructional approaches and self-determination, uh, partnership working and support for key people, and the elimination of aversive, restrictive and abusive practices. In terms of theory and evidence base, well, three things there really. So the idea of this uh, biopsychosocial model of behaviours that challenges, that connects everything that's known from a, a range of disciplines to inform our understanding of how these behaviours come to be, how they're maintained and how we can best um, support positive change. The use of behavioural science as the, the kind of the bedrock for how we inform and understand these processes, but also the integration of other um, multi-professional and cross-disciplinary approaches that are consistent with this biopsychosocial model um, and the rights and values components of PBS. And in terms of the process and strategy to actually make these things happen, um, a number of things. So the idea of uh, basing everything on evidence, so decisions throughout a PBS process being based on data, being based on different forms of evidence um, to provide the most practical and ethical means of operating. Um, the idea of providing high quality care and support environments that increase quality of life for people in the context of behaviours that challenge, but also um, create universal preventative strategies and environments in relation to behaviours that challenge through through that means. Um, we talk about bespoke assessment, so functional assessment and, and how that becomes a key part of positive behaviour support, uh, the use of multi-component personalised support plans, um, and then um, a range of other implementation um, and evaluation strategies. So what I'm going to talk about today in particular is uh, these components about the person-centred foundation and constructional uh, approaches and self-determination, touching a little bit on this third one about partnership working and support for key people. Um, and in terms of some of the how, um, these things here, so thinking about functional assessment, bespoke assessment and the development of multi-component personalised support plans. OK, so the person centred foundation. So recognising here, underscoring that person centred goal formation is a critical aspect of PBS. Um, and that there's a range of person centred approaches and tools available that can be used in this regard to help figure out these kinds of things for and with people. So in ways that help us understand people's preferences and likes and dislikes, their needs, uh, their special interests and talents and gifts and skills, uh, the things that they might dream and aspire to. Um, ultimately, things which allow us to try and determine with individuals what a good life means for them and how this might best be achieved through individualized systems of support. This idea that if 
one of the key goals, the dual goals of PBS is about supporting a good life. We need to determine what that means at an individual basis. But that also we need to be aspirational in doing this. A good life isn't one that's just kind of good enough. Um, it's, it's one life. So a good life that is rich and vital, not just devoid of problems. And that needs a person centred approach to fully determine um, and commit to making um, that a reality for people. So the second values and rights based component there is about constructional approaches and self determination. So there's a few dimensions to this. So firstly, by definition, when we're thinking about people with learning disabilities, we are really talking about people that will experience a range of challenges in terms of communication, expression, um, decision making, um, and gaining autonomy, gaining independence. But we also know from the work that we do and, and the science that we base our work on, that it is possible um, to support people with learning disabilities to develop a whole range of skills in these areas so that they can express their needs and wishes, engage in life in meaningful ways that are right for them and that support their well-being and a good life. Um, but often that isn't the context, that isn't the situation people live in. Um, more commonly, people with learning disabilities um, find themselves in circumstances where they're not supported to develop or maintain these sorts of skills. They live within systems that don't support um, expression and engagement in choice making, that don't give them opportunities to learn how to make choices over time and to have preferences uh, recognised and honoured. So that's the context. And this is really, uh, in a sense, a manifestation of the social model of disability. We recognise here that it's society's failure to provide appropriate services, to provide ways of honouring and acting on people's needs and rights um, in terms of the way society is organised, in terms of the way services are organised, which is the problem. This is what creates uh, this disability. So in that context, PBS is about systems change, really, transforming these systems in two main ways. So firstly, in terms of a constructional philosophy, ensuring that people with learning disabilities are supported to learn and develop and refine a whole range of skills that relate to communication um, and decision making. Hand in hand with that, um, is this principle of self-determination and the right to self-determination, a right to be able to express oneself and make choices which are positively acted upon, to have agency within your own life. In terms of um, some of the, the practical elements of PBS, how do we actually make these um, rights and values components become a reality? Well, some of those happen through the context of these sorts of processes. So bespoke or functional um, assessment does this in at least two ways or could do this in at least two ways. So firstly, um, it can do it when we recognise the focus of functional assessment should be on behaviours that have been agreed in consultation with partners. And that includes the focal person themselves for who the the, um, the assessment is, is um, intended to support and others around them. So that's the starting point and determining that focus um, is a really kind of key stage. That's something I'm going to come back to um, in a little bit. The other part then is about um, during the process of that assessment, finding ways and opportunities to engage directly with people with learning disabilities themselves in ways which are right for that individual um, and in ways which are uh, reliable. And often that means um, drawing on uh, methodologies and technologies from a range of different disciplines and integrating those um, within the context of other elements of behavioural science. And then the, the final part there, just to 
to reference about the development of multi-component personalized support plans and underscoring the personalized part there. So in terms of um, uh, this question about whose decision is it? Well, support plans and PBS again need to be focused on um, strategies that um, are directed in terms of the, the personal goals and outcomes that are identified for and with a person with learning disabilities. Only by doing this can we ensure that supports are ultimately bespoke, that they are fully individualised. And this needs to um, elicit, involve partnership working and consultation throughout development and implementation of plans. And that has to include, um, to make this um, truly bespoke, um, the views and experiences of the focal person in some way. Um, and just reference there as well, I won't describe this in very much detail today, but when we talk about um, evaluation in the final component, we also recognise that we need to come full circle here when we're trying to look at you know, is PBS effective at an individual level, at a bigger systems level? This needs to connect with those dimensions of life quality, um, those dimensions of need that are particular to the, the goals um, and aspirations of individuals. Okay, so those are, I guess, some of the guiding kind of principles that, that kind of connect there, but we're still left with some questions about how. And we don't have all of the technology at the moment. We're needing to, I think, sort of develop um, and build towards that. But we have, I think, some options already. Um, so again, thinking about the starting place, we are talking about people who, by nature of having a learning disability, and by nature of the way society often operates, um, are in a very challenging set of circumstances. We're talking about people who present with a range of communication needs and learning difficulties, um, and live in systems which um, make choice making um, and gaining control often a real challenge. And these are the situations we need to work with. There's all sorts of things which um, historically um, and still uh, um, are helpful in terms of uh, behavioural methods for supporting change and agency in this regard. Things like preference and reinforcer assessments, things like direct observation, all of these technologies um, are, are important in this regard. But arguably at the moment aren't sufficient to really uh, fully achieve the kinds of um, constructional um, approaches and elements of self-determination we might aspire to. There are some examples of uh, functional assessment procedures, functional assessment interview procedures, which do um, have mechanisms for involving directly engagement uh, with individuals for who that assessment is, is the focus. Often those have been for people who don't have um, in an intellectual disability, don't have a learning disability, who uh, largely communicate through verbal means. And so we need to try and uh, develop, move towards identification of um, a broader range of, of methods. Um, and this, again, this idea of sort of expanding, embracing, exploring, connecting across disciplines um, is something which is uh, recognised as a a defining feature of, of positive behaviour support. It's our component seven um, in, the, in the framework there. Okay, so I want to share um, a few examples here of some other ways which we might seek to um, directly engage with people with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities in, in some of these processes. Uh, the paper on the right there is the one I'm going to focus on uh, to the to the greater degree. Um, and these papers are are freely available. You can access these for free if you'd like to follow up um, later. OK, so the focus here um, for me has been on um, goals, really supporting um, goal selection with people who have learning and developmental disabilities within the context of uh, behavioural support. 
Um, and there's a few reasons why I've kind of opted to uh, focus on this area. So firstly, conceptually, this idea that goals and outcomes are kind of interlinked, they go hand in hand. Um, if we select and very carefully define what we want to happen, um, and then measure whether it does happen, that's a, that's a pretty good way of supporting that thing to happen or to committing to making it happen. Um, but often um, in behavioural support, uh, the focus of what we do in terms of what we assess, in, what, in terms of what we try and change, um, in terms of the outcomes we might monitor, um, are determined by someone other than the individual themselves. Um, and that situation is changing. That's really why we're here today. But historically, that's often been the case. And sometimes that's the case because actually it's very, very challenging to find ways of supporting someone with communication complexities to inform that process. But also there's lots of systemic reasons that prevent that kind of involvement, it would seem. But if we could find ways of um, better connecting um, and involving individuals themselves in identifying uh, the focus of goals for behaviour support, um, we might do two things. We might increase further um, uh, in terms of um, in, in eliciting, um, embodying the rights and the values of positive behaviour support, but also in terms of the effectiveness of that support. OK, so the method I've been um, using in these studies um, is talking mats. And I think you had um, some uh, presentation about talking mats yesterday as well. But just in case you, you missed any of that, uh, talking mats are effectively visually based communication tools. They help people, all people, um, to organise um, and express their views. Um, they've been um, developed I guess um, in the field of speech and language therapy, not really in the field of behaviour analysis. Um, and they've been used to support people who present with a whole range of communication difficulties um, for different reasons. So that includes people with um, learning disabilities. It also includes people who have dementia, who don't have learning disabilities, people who might have a brain injury, um, a whole range of different folks. Um, and in simple terms, they involve uh, the placement of visual symbols um, to different areas of a mat. And typically that's a physical mat, like a, like a small piece of carpet. You can do this in an electronic way, but placing those visual symbols in an area of the mat, which indicates um, someone's views or feelings in relation to a particular topic area. Um, and um, in general, talking mats are considered suitable um, for or helpful for supporting communication with people that have a receptive language um, ability at a two word level. Um, and these are what I used in this kind of, kind of range of range of studies in some different ways. So here's an example of a, of a talking mat. This is one of the ones I used and I'll kind of come back to this later. Um, so this talking mat was about things uh, people might like doing, different activities. So you can see there's three main column areas there. And at the start of using the mat, that's all we'd have, those three column areas with the top cards. And, and I'd have a deck of the, the stimuli there. Um, and in each case, I'd ask the individual I'm working with, communicating with, tell me about doing uh, gardening. Um, is that something you like uh, doing a lot? like a little bit you're not sure about or you don't like. And I'd hand the card um, to the person and they'd place the card in an area of the map that to them made sense in terms of their, their, um, their kind of preference or their kind of like or dislike or uncertainty about, um, about that particular activity. Um, so in this first paper, um, I worked with a number of individuals and I'll tell you about them uh, in just a moment to try and identify different goals uh, that might be relevant to their behavioural support uh, when they received it. Um, and so some different mats that I worked across um, in relation to some different potential goal areas. 
So firstly, starting with activities, things that people liked doing, things which might relate to potential reinforcers or, or preferred activities in terms of someone's uh, kind of routine that make up a good, a good quality of life. I also looked on a separate mat um, about things that people like, might like to be able to do more of in terms of skills and adaptive behaviours, things people might want support with to develop um, over time. I then moved on to looking at things people might want support with to do less of. So in terms of behaviours that challenge, being able to select um, those behaviours as a focus for further behavioural support. Um, in some instances, I could then move on to working with individuals to think about the behaviour of other people. So the behaviour of caregivers, so things that a caregiver did that people liked, things that caregivers did that people didn't like, and things they might want to see more of or less of in terms of the support other people gave them in the future. And then in some instances, uh, being able to um, think about quality of life areas in a slightly more abstract way, things which are important for individuals in terms of their life um, at a values level and that they need to ref have reflected in terms of that behaviour support. And none of this being quick work, this being work that took time um, and it required lots of planning um, and support with individuals before, before we got going. So here's an example of, um, again, this is the, um, the activities mat. So this is the first one we started with. Um, in these studies, there was an extra kind of question at the end. It's not typical of talking mats, but after laying everything out, checking that uh, people were happy with their, their placements, their selections, um, providing people with extra cards if there was anything we didn't have a card for and creating a, creating a reference for that. I'd ask people um, this question in blue. So is there anything here you'd like to do more of in the future or in some cases less of um, and to be able to select goals on that basis? So here's just an example of um, another talking mat. So this is the talking mat in relation to behaviours that challenge. So here the question was something along these lines. So we all do things that aren't so positive sometimes. Uh, so what are some of the other things you do? Um, laying out the map in that same sort of way and then asking, um, would you like support to do any of these things less in the future and which ones? And again, allowing an opportunity for people to identify those behaviours they'd like some support with as, as part of their PBS work. Um, so this table just shows, um, the, again, the different topic areas which were covered across those mats um, and the range of stimuli or starter stimuli um, that I had in my kind of deck of uh, talking mats cards. Uh, there's some examples of the, the sorts of things that that included. Um, but just to reference that in all cases and as a standard part of a talking mats uh, methodology, there's always some blank cards. So there's always the opportunity to make additional um, items if there's something which um, is also important for people that you, you haven't pre-planned. Um, this table shows um, some of the, the characteristics of the individuals I worked with. In this study, so 14 uh, young people all together, males and females, a range of ages there um, and diagnoses, um, and a range of communication abilities also. Um, and all of these individuals um, had a history of displaying behaviours that challenge um, uh, across a range of different topographies. All of these individuals were awaiting behavioural support. They were on a waiting list for that kind of support within NHS services or seeking that kind of support. Um, in terms of how I coded um, and rated um, some of the responses, 
Um, well, I developed a, a slightly different way of doing this to the traditional talking mats method. Um, so all of the interviews were video recorded. Um, and then for each placement, each stimuli placement that an individual made, I considered those as a discrete response um, and uh, coded the area of the mat uh, that was placed in. Um, then also coded um, the validity of that, um, of that placement. Um, so we had a set of um, criteria which related to that in terms of um, I guess whether the how engaged the individual appeared to be when making that placement um, or whether it was an accidental placement. Um, and then uh, gain some inter-rater reliability um, on those placements and validity um, uh, kind of ratings. So 50% of the mats that were covered overall across 50% of the sample covering all of those topic experts, uh, topic areas. Um, and had a talking mats expert um, kind of co-rate those and we've got 100% uh, into rate of reliability on those. Um, then also ran something called the effectiveness framework of functional communication. So this is the standard way of um, scoring the quality of talking mats um, kind of delivery in terms of the quality of communication interaction um, and uh, they got a 27.2 average on that, which is right near the, the top end of, of, of quality. Um, and where individuals were um, engaging verbally at the same time, um, kind of made a transcript and recorded some of those also. So overall, what we found is that um, talking mats interviews of this nature um, could be completed with nine of the, those 14 young people um, to varying degrees. Uh, typically, uh, those with greater verbal abilities did that more readily. Um, for the other five uh, young people uh, in, in the sample there, uh, did try a variety of other things to try and find ways of helping people um, to um, identify what was important for them and to select goals, but couldn't establish something within the context of that study in a meaningful way. Um, a few other, um, I guess, kind of kind of positive outcomes. Um, none of the interviews at any point had to be kind of terminated or or were kind of prevented um, due to instances of behaviours that challenge. In all of this being kind of pre, um, you know, functional assessment, pre uh, kind of uh, behaviour support intervention planning and implementation. So quite interesting to be able to do this kind of work at that sort of stage um, and the work seemed to be uh, highly valued by families it seemed to be uh, very much enjoyed by uh, children and young people themselves regardless of whether uh, those uh, talking mats um, resulted in um, kind of goal selection or not or right for the individual or not so something really important about the endeavor here of um, seeking ways to engage and interact with children and young people in these sorts of ways as early as possible um, and get on side with people and try and seek ways of understanding their views. Um, so for the nine who completed uh, talking mats interviews, um, again, across a range of these talking mats, pretty much in the order um, that they were explored, um, people most readily were able to engage in relation to preferred activities um, in the adaptive uh, sort of pro-social behaviours and challenging behaviours maps. It's slightly more abstract to think about the behaviour um, of another individual, but some, some of the children were able to do that, um, and to a lesser degree, uh, but still across um, some of the interviews, it was possible to talk about these broader kind of quality of life domains. Um, a few examples here of, of some of the things which um, uh, children and young people sort of spoke about um, if they were able to make additional sort of verbal contributions. So there's Ben there talking in relation to the behaviours that challenge uh, Matt, talking about having a freak out um, uh, when he's stressed. Um, this was in relation to pulling hair. And it was interesting that across 
these mats, children and young people appear to be quite willing, quite open to talk about, describe their own behaviours that challenge in a way that they didn't feel judged uh, um, and were able to be uh, quite sort of transparent about. And seemed to be something quite important about the context in which these interviews and discussions happened that allowed for that. We've got David there. Um, he's talking about the behaviour of a caregiver, less shouting and smacking. I want those to go whoosh out of the door. So again, really interesting in terms of systems change uh, when we uh, or if we can find ways of supporting individuals to talk about the behaviour of others around them in terms of what that might allow us to do in terms of creating change. Natasha there is talking about things, um, things that she's particularly good at and that we could then sort of celebrate um, and identify and build on as a, as a skill and, and talent for Natasha. So helping other people as the stimuli. I do that a lot, like I help with my mum's shopping and well, Chris has crutches at my school. I got him pencils or a chair. Um, and Emily there um, in relation to the same sort of map, but it's talking about something she finds or found particularly sort of difficult in terms of um, sort of interaction and um, kind of social engagement, something that she'd like support with um, to um, kind of build on in, in the future, something that would be very possible. Um, and then lastly, this is Max. Um, and Max, this is in relation to the first mat about activities, um, but allowing for some quite nuanced kind of goal selection here. So Max had identified swimming as being kind of something he likes doing and he wants to do more of, but not just any swimming, a particular pool, like the the fun pool, the one with the slide, not the one where he does his swimming lessons. It's something he wants to do more. Um, so just to reference um, slightly more briefly, a related paper here, um, similar methodology. So using talking mats again, covering the same sorts of goal areas, but here working with family caregivers. Um, and so from family caregivers perspectives, trying to identify uh, what might be important in terms of goals for their child, for their, for their, for their, for their young person. I mean, again, using a talking mats uh, methodology, but using um, uh, verbal stimuli instead of pictures this time, but the same sorts of thing. Um, and again, finding this to be a really helpful process for caregivers to engage um, and inform goal selection. So caregivers being able to do this, I mean, identify a range of goals, um, but recognising this was often quite a complex process. It wasn't really a case of just asking people, what do you want to focus on? What's important? Often there was quite a lot of dialogue um, and discussion that needed to take place to um, identify um, those things and discern what might be possible and most meaningful um, for families um, and for their child and how those things could be synthesized. And talking mats were quite helpful in that regard because they allow um, a way of laying out what are quite complex um, kind of ideas and discussions um, and keeping track of those um, in an objective way. Um, and then finally, just to reference um, uh, uh, another related study, and this one's with um, children uh, and young people with with learning disabilities um, and communication difficulties using a similar methodology, um, a talking maths methodology again, um, but here in the context of a, a functional assessment. So thinking about, well, how could we uh, best um, support an individual to uh, provide information, uh, to report on views and ideas which are relevant to the sorts of things we typically need to uh, identify in a in a functional assessment. So this was in relation to working with three individuals, three young people with learning disabilities in a school environment. Um, and so uh, there's a talking mat here that was looking at things people like, what might be things that might relate to reinforcers. Um, again, in terms of the things um, children did, in terms of behaviours that challenge. Uh, we looked at things that might help um, children on a bad day. So a day where behaviours that challenge might be particularly likely. 
So things which might inform um, de-escalation strategies, for instance. And we also looked at things that make for a bad day, things which might relate to motivational operations or other stimuli which um, maintain behaviours that, that challenge. Okay, so just a few um, final thoughts um, from me. So coming back to this uh, starting question then of whose decision is it anyway? Well, um, it would seem that the rights-based argument it is is pretty it's pretty clear it's pretty kind of unrefutable really um, this connection between agency and effectiveness is something interesting to to explore but e either way we've got enough uh, kind of values based reasons to be doing this this work um, there's a couple of examples I've sort of shared here um, about ways of kind of working in that sort of space um, with some kind of encouraging experiences, I think, um, from that. Um, but lots more still to do. Um, so much more to do to think about people with a with a greater range of complexities of communication need. We saw there in that study that five of those um, individuals, um, talking max wasn't right for them in terms of their needs um, and um, in terms of finding ways uh, to express and inform uh, goal selection. And so we need a, a greater range of technologies and ways to do that. Um, we also need, I think, to continue to think about and find ways of integrating and understanding uh, the different sources of information, the different perspectives and values that are expressed from key people within the system. So um, the needs and preferences of uh, people with learning disabilities might sometimes be different to those of, um, of, uh, of, of staff or family caregivers and how we can connect those and bring those together is, is quite interesting. I think it's also um, an ongoing kind of question to think about and monitor and explore um, how doing this kind of work, how kind of working towards goals and uh, better engagement of individuals themselves in these processes actually relates to outcomes. Um, and the effectiveness and the quality of support that people ultimately experience. Um, and then finally, a reflection, I think, is on, I guess, the time and the process which is required here. None of this is kind of quick stuff. Um, creating this uh, definition of PBS this time round wasn't a quick process. Um, establishing a space in a way to do this kind of talking mats work with uh, with individuals and with families isn't a quick thing. It takes a lot of setting up, it takes a lot of kind of preparation, but it seems to be a really valuable um, process and something which needs to be kind of reflected in that in that work. Um, and it, what also seems to be the case is that along the way, you know, the process of doing this work um, has a, a range of other functions in terms of rapport building and, and relationship building. Okay, so I think that's probably me. Um, so to say uh, thank you again, um, it's always a little bit strange presenting um, <laughs> online. Um, so thank you for your, uh, your patience. Um, welcome any kind of comments, any questions you might have. Uh, hi Nick, we've, we've had a deluge of those, so um, I, I will begin at the beginning. Um, so I should ask, before doing the talking mats, would it be helpful to do a task analysis with the pictures to assess understanding of what they mean and factors such as left, right, side preference? Um, it, that's a good question. It, it might be. I mean, I think there's a, there's a broader... Um, response to that uh, initially, I think, in that um, I think it'd be interesting to um, keep trying to find ways of refining or kind of building on the talking mats processing procedure. Mm. Um, and some of the, the kind of thinking, some of the kind of skill set of behaviour analysts could be really interesting in that regard. I think it's that thing that we've got, I think, a really um, helpful methodology here, 
Mm. Um, but it hasn't been developed by paid random risk. So the starting point is different, you know, and that, that's not a, it's just a difference. It's not a values based um, mm. distinction. So that might be the case. Those kinds of questions about, well, how can we kind of enhance the kind of the usefulness of talking maths uh, with some of the things which might be more common to paid random analytic practice, I think mm. is a really important thing to explore. Um, that thing about the, you know, specifically about the kind of, I guess, almost like pre-assessment type stuff. Mm. That's kind of interesting. I don't know. Um, what we typically find is that if if people have the, I guess, the kind of starting capacity to operate with the talking mats, um, then um, the ability to sort of understand, I guess, what a symbol means is at a symbolic level. Mm. You know, it means what it means. Um, so, um, and because you're also talking about things typically in the abstract, aren't you? You're talking about things mm. which are in the in the here and now. So some of those uh, kind of communication abilities probably kind of cluster together. I think there probably is a question about what your starting deck is of stimuli, mm. you know, and kind of um, how you select what those are in the in the first place. Um, yes, so there, there are some there are some related comments, I think, and I think. You know, as as this work progresses, it sounds as though this is something that will come up a lot. Um, uh, another one around severe learning disability from Jane, um, we're talking about not in, making sure that we aren't over assuming competence, and to make sure that we're taking, uh, I guess, views from from multiple stakeholders, uh, whether that be deputies or parents. Um, and then Maria's has come in to say that we're raising huge issues of understanding and interpreting the right way or or better the appropriate way uh, the needs of individuals to be able to connect uh, them with the, 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 the services with others and offer quality support where it's needed or where the person is, um, I guess, unable to, to, to necessarily make reliable choices. But there's something that Sandy said in the last presentation around um, the talking mat not being a fait accompli and I think you've infer you've inferred this too like if you're taking this premise and, and projecting it forward into functional assessment and I suppose also preference assessment and I suppose also I guess what somebody finds reinforcing is that a, a choice that's translated into opportunity you'll get to see in terms of behavior of the individuals whether or not that was a reliable choice and what then might need to be informed and, and I guess that's maybe where we clash with the more conceptual aspects of behavior analysis where you were thinking uh, behavioral contracts are very hard to I guess necessarily measure until you get to the outcome right I mean until you get to the point where you're thinking oh yeah no that was exactly what that person wanted um there was a, there, were, there were a couple of other comments um uh, let me just see how to maybe make them bring them together there was, there's, there was a comment around, um, or a comment and a question around the presentation. Uh, this is from Sarah. She's saying she's currently using talking maps for the young person they support. However, she, the, she, the, the service user, finds it extremely difficult and overwhelming to talk about things I would like to do less. She's very aware of them, but feels very embarrassed. Uh, and, and I guess the, the question overriding is, um, uh, how do you overcome this? I mean, I guess that's quite a, that's a philosophical question, but absolutely, we'd need to overcome it. Uh, did you have you talked about those that it was accessible to within within your within your your study what were the types of reasons why it wasn't accessible to some of the others and maybe that kind of answers the questions well i think um i think probably are two different things there, actually i mean <clears throat> for, the, for the five that um you know really tried a whole bunch of other things as well kind of different card sorting exercises and all sorts of things so in terms of i guess finding a technology that was right for people's communication needs mm. that was the that was the thing and i couldn't do it that was the thing so talking maths wasn't right tried a bunch of other things and um you know i guess at a clinical level you know and i, I this was in a research context so i didn't get the opportunity to go on and continue to work with these individuals mm -hmm. we had a great rapport at the end of that right because we tried so many things we'd spent so much time together right um, and so we knew each other, but um, didn't have, couldn't get that kind of data in that in that kind of way. So it's still helpful, but more in terms of um, yeah, not having the technology or not having the skill to make that happen. Uh, and the, the, the rapport bit, I think, is really really important. And it, it's again, it's really hard, isn't it? Really hard to talk about some of these things. Mm. Um, and 
you know, it, I think that, that that kind of that kind of context of taking some time and not kind of pressurizing too much, and you know, some that might take a very long time for some mm. people to be able to kind of kind of express. And because usually yeah, and that's really important, isn't it? Because we've got other questions. That one, um, one from Russell that alludes to uh, generalizing this into behavior support plans in home or social care environments. Robbie talks about um, is it important to establish or or understand whether or not the le the learner has emotional understanding from from their own point of view. Um, uh, we've also got Sarah who actually asked the same question around those that were could, uh, are unable to access a talking mat. We've got um, Sophia who talks about how situations where choices might be made for, I guess, more dangerous or more risky activity and, and multiple stakeholders are thinking, well, actually, yeah, I see the choice, I hear your choice, but actually that that's a big risk. Um, and then Maria kind of sums it up really, and I think really this is what this is talking to from your point of view, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, we're, we're, sort of, we're talking about quality support. So that journey from uh, understanding this kind of idea of building and creating autonomy that Sandy that Sandy spoke about through to your 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 goal of involving people in their own functional assessment, like a talking about in of itself is nothing more than another thing, is it? It has to, has to mean something that the, the communication mode has to go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's the it's the intent. I mean, it's a technology, isn't it? It's a yeah, like I say, it's a tool. It's one thing, and it, it's not the panacea of all things by any means. But I think it's also the way it's done, isn't it? Mm. You know, it's exactly. like all of these things. It's like the way a functional assessment interview is done with a family caregiver. And it isn't just the questions on the page, right? It's the it's the engagement process well, we, and that rapport building, and helping the understanding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which brings me to, I guess, another kind of um, rhetorical question to a certain extent. It's around the, the training of frontline staff, because obviously all this research and, and you know, going back, I know you referenced the Winter, Winterbourne Viewer right at the beginning, and, and that in itself back then yielded the white paper that talks about PBS being a, a predetermined or necessary uh, supporting framework within those types of services, but it, it's yet to properly manifest. So there's clearly a time lag. And then I think this type of work is, you can almost envisage frontline staff without the proper support sort of saying, oh, I did the talking mat, so I know what he wants. And then it's like, well, yeah, you did a talking mat, but there was not much else. Yeah. All right, Nick, thank, thank you so much Thanks for your, so much. For your uh, talk. It was super informative and actually very exciting in terms of the shape of the field. And people ought to recognize that the work that Nick and colleagues do is, is informing and going toward um, hopefully national policy in the end and certainly just in terms of influence and guidance in, in those sort of upper echelons, um, particularly around the Charlotte Foundation work.